Okay, now. Okay, let's get it started. Today we have lots to cover, Nick, and then we just move so fast. Now, guys, the first thing that we want to do, hi, Jackson. The first thing that we just want to do is this, we as a kind of a reminder ourselves of what we did, what did we do last time? I'm just gonna just uh, ask you, we just start from the basic ones, Kriyash and Russell and Jan. Everything is good at the back? Yes, awesome. Now, what we want to do is this, we want to find the sign of 75 degrees. And as I said, you do not have to memorize these stuff. The important thing is that learn how to apply the techniques. And that's all that matters. Do not memorize step by step, but learn how to apply them. <laughs> Okay, now look at this. Now we have sine of 75 degrees. It means that we are locating ourselves in the unit circle at the angle, which is 75 degrees. And now what do we expect? We expect that to find, I should say, R, uh, the ratio of the trigonometric. But before that, Let's imagine if that's going to be the right triangle and it's going to be a unit circle. 75 degrees, which quadrant it is located? 75 degrees in the unit circle, which quadrant you expect to find and localize that angle? Quadrant one, thank you, Jackson. Then it means that we are going to be located here. It means that if that's going to be 75 degrees, we expect to have both sine and cosine a positive number because we are at the first quadrant. However, the 75 degrees is not a well identified degrees, Jayan, because it's neither 30, 75, or how much? 45. Then the thing that we ask ourselves how to convert and transform 75 degrees ash into either of those well down at angles. Then what are those angles? I can convert 75 degrees into that. 19 minus? I have one idea that it says that 75 equals 19 minus 15. And guys, look at that. Is it a good transformation from 75 degrees into those angles? Who thinks that's a good one? It's not a good one because we said that, Nick, we said that we know everything about the 19, but 15 is a problem for us because 15, we do not know anything about this. We know either about 30, either about 45, or about how much? 16. Then 15 is not one of them. But how about if I say 75 equals 45 plus 30, which it gives me 75 now. Then as a result, what can I do? I say that the sine of 75 equals the sine of 45 plus 30. And now we see that we have a sine ratio of the sum of two angles. We remember Caitlin from last session. Yes, of course. We, we talked about this identity that sine alpha plus beta is sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine beta. That's the identity that we always remember that. And we have proved it a couple of I should say weeks ago. Then here, we said that the sign of 45 plus 30 equals to sine 45, cosine 30 plus cosine 45, sine 30 by using that identity. 
and you come ask yourself, oh my God, 45, 30, how can I memorize these ratios? I say that, okay, always remember these triangles. For the 16 and 45, we said that if it's gonna be 30, it's the right triangle, Rihanna, which is the square root of three, one, and two. Then you see that the sine of 30, based on the definition, Michelle, is going to... Okay, now, now, we said that the sign of 30 is the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is 2. And the cosine of 30 is how much? Adjacent over the hypotenuse. That's what we learned. Then as a result, if I come here and also for 45, we said that 45 is going to be this. It's one, one square root of two. We always memorize these, I should say, triangles. Then the sine of 45 always equals the cosine of 45. It's how much? That's right. It becomes one over square root of two. You normalize it, square root of two over two. Then as a result, by knowing this stuff, I go back to here. Then I notice that then sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 30, we got it, square root of 3 over 2. Cosine of 45 is the square root of 2 over 2. And sine of 30 is 1 over 2. Then here, what is left for us is to multiply the numbers together and just simplify that at the end. But the purpose here was that to identify that 75 degrees is, can be transformed into two angles, then we use this identity. Any questions so far? No? Everyone is good? No. Let's go to the other practice. In the other practice, I'm gonna ask you to just find the value for this result. I say that the sine 40 cosine 160 minus cosine of 40 sine 160. I'm just gonna ask you, evaluate that expression by using one single ratio. Look at this, we have two expressions here. One sine 40, cosine 160, and we have cosine 40, sine 160. And I say that transform it into only one single ratio. Yes. Which one? On the previous example? Yeah. You mean this one? Uh, yeah. Oh, no, no, the one before. The one before. This one, yeah, that one. Oh, no, wait, even, even, even. Yes, it's okay. Just we only multiply them and we add them. I left it on your own then. Now, guys, then, now I just want to ask you, please, take a couple of seconds to see that if you can transform this expression into one single unit of ratios. We have two expressions. Now we just only need one trigonometric ratio. Give it a try yourself to see that how much you're gonna end with. Any ideas? Now, I'm gonna do that the step by step, Rihanna. Next time, guys, if I ask you, please listen. Next time, I'm just gonna ask you to just sit separate. Okay. Anyhow, I, I hear a voice from your side then. Sorry about that. Because this part is very important for the upcoming test. And this one is very important. And that's why I emphasize, please listen. 
Now, at this stage, guys, the thing that we have is this. We say that based on the things that we have learned, we say that we have an identity sine of two angles if they are subtracted. It's written as sine alpha cosine beta. However, it comes as minus cosine alpha sine beta. Is it clear for everyone? It's, it's totally fine, huh? So far. Now, why did I use this? Because I noticed that here I have minus these two expressions. Then I said that the best identity which I have learned so far is the sum of two angles if they are subtracted, the sine of alpha minus this. In this case, imagine I take 40 representing the alpha and I take 160 representing the beta. Then Lauren, it's gonna be obvious that I can rewrite the whole expression like this. I can write this expression like that. I say sine 40 cosine 6160. It's like sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha sine beta, which it means that I can rewrite it as what? As the sine of the subtraction alpha minus beta alpha is 40 but beta is minus 60 then now you see that then as a result we can rewrite sine 40 cosine 160 minus cosine 40 sine 160 just only as the sine of, and you know that 40 minus 160 becomes how much? Minus 120. Right? Then you see that you are not done yet. You have just started because you have to just do further simplification. And that's why I asked you to be very attentive right now. Then as a result, you see that the sum of these, these two expressions give you one single expression. And this is the sine of minus 120. Now, don't worry, what do we want to do in the trigonometric ratios? The negative angles, what does it tell you? It means that you either, for example, if you were in this, for example, if imagine, if that's going to be a Cartesian plane, and this is going to be the unit circle, the case that you have a negative angle is the case, as you remember, we said that you just look at these, I should say, moving mosquito on the circumference of this unit circle, but that mosquito just moves clockwise. And that's why it's measuring the angle like that. And that was the only case that we said that the angle in the unit circle is going to be minus. However, we learned something very important and we talked about that used as a symmetry. We said that if we have an angle, which is minus, I'm, it's, it's a kind of a reminder, but that's very important. We said that if, oh my God, this class is the only one which I have that problem with this projector. We said that if you have an angle, which is minus, minus alpha, of course, I can just do the same thing. I say that if this is minus alpha and it moved counterclockwise, I said that I can also measure the same segment of the unit circle, but I move clock counterclockwise. Now I just moved in this direction. It was previously we moved clockwise, 
That's why you just got minus alpha. Now I just move counterclockwise and I get the same slice of this cake. But it's going to be plus alpha. Does it make sense to everyone? Now, yes. No, it depends. And I'm telling you why. Look at this. For these two angles, I have this one. It was the mosquito M here, and this is M prime. Look at this. I'm going to see, I'm going to answer the questions, the good questions that uh, the Ash asked. Look at this. For the same angle, you see that if I connect them, project them along the X axis, they cross and intersect at the same point along the X axis, J. Then as a result, we say that with these two angles, we can say that the sine of minus alpha, it's e sorry, it's going to be cosine now, not the sine. We said that the cosine of minus alpha, ash, it's equal to the cosine of the alpha. That was the first law of the symmetry that we talked about this couple of sessions ago. But at the same time, you notice that if I just want to find the corresponding, I should say, the sign I project along the Y, this blue line, the intersection on the Y axis gives me what? Gives me the sign. This is the sign. This is the sign. But you see that the sign of the alpha is above the origin. This is positive. The sign of minus alpha is below the origin, and this is negative. Then as a result, we drive this ratio, this law, that the sine of minus alpha is equal to the sine of the alpha, but with the minus sign. Does it make sense, Ash? And that's the thing that you asked. Do you have a function? That's right. You have to identify which quadrants they are and what's the relationship when they cross the x and y axis. Then as a result, guys, oh, look at this one. Look at these two mosquitoes, M and M prime. For the cosine, what do you do? You project from these points to the x-axis. And you see that both of them, they just cross the same points on the x-axis, and this is this one. Then you see that the angle alpha and the angle minus alpha they cross the x-axis always at the same place, then the cosine is going to be always the same. And that was the reason for this one that I mentioned, cosine alpha equals minus cos equals cosine of minus alpha. But for the second one, Ash, look at this. I project along the y-axis. You see that, the blue lines? From the origin to that intersection, it defines the sine axis. You see that the sine of the alpha is above the x-axis. The sine of M prime is below the x-axis. That means that they have opposite numbers. Then the sine of alpha is minus sine of minus alpha. Does it make sense, everyone? This is the laws of the symmetry. Does it make sense, Ash? That's the simple law. That's right. The projections on the x-axis is always cosine. The symmetry of the x-axis. That's right. Exactly. Then as a result, what can we say on your test or anywhere when you get a negative number, like the one which we have here, we have sinus 1 minus 20. When you get to a negative number, you have to stop and think to yourself and say that I hate to have a negative number because we have to be consistent. You have to be always moving towards counterclockwise. Then always you have to just start to say that sine of minus 120, which I got here, it has to become transformed into a, to a positive angle. Because this is our convention in trigonometry, we have to always move counterclockwise. Then if you move counterclockwise, we expect to always, oh my God, look at this one, but just blocking the view. But if you, if you assign, if you have that convention, Russell, 
that we always have to move counterclockwise, then we expect always Kelvin to always have the positive value for the angle. Then if I happen to be somewhere like this question, that I have an angle which is negative, I said that this is against the law. And I hate to just break the law, then I have to transform sine minus 120 into sine 120, that's a positive number. But is it by its own? Is it, is it, is it fair to say that sine minus 120 equals to sine 120? No, because we learned it right now that the sine of an angle with its sine of negative one, they are the same, but they differ from one minus two. Then what I'm going to do is this. Then what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put the minus here. Then I say that, okay, now sine of minus 120 equals to minus sine of 120. Now, Russell, my friend, is asking me, hmm, what is sine of 120? It means that, okay, now we are just getting you started. Now we have to find minus sine of 120. I'm just going to go to that page, minus sine of 120. There are two methods to find it based on the things that we have learned previous last time. I say that method one, method one. I'm just gonna keep minus before. I'm just gonna, I, I'm gonna make sure that I have one minus, which is multiplied to that. I'm just gonna go back to this later. But I say that I put all my attention to find this value first sine of 120, then I multiply minus to that at the end. Now, let's use the first method. See, what do we get? We say sine of 120, we haven't seen that before. It's not kind of those celebrity angles, 30, 45, and 60. Then what do I do, Lauren? I say, it's like if I say call the names, do not say think that I say that there's something wrong. I'm just naming people. Then I say 120, it can be written as 90 plus 30. These are the best two angles which we have seen them before, Michelle. Then as a result, I say sine of 90 plus 30. No, no, let me write it like that. I say sine of 120 equals to sine of 90 plus 30. I'm all right. This is the same thing. But we learned something last time that we said that whenever we have this angle, which is 90, it is going to really do a transformation, complete transformation on your ratios. It moves sine to cosine. Now, we identified, we said that we have this identity. I'm just going to write it here. We said that the sine of pi over two or 90 plus alpha equals to the cosine of what? Alpha. That's what we call, we call that co-functions. Now, you said that I can't remember that one always. I'm just gonna use the identities that have for the sum of two angles, Jackson. Then we say that, okay, no worries. Sine of 90 plus 30 is the sine of 90 cosine of 30 plus cosine of 90 sine 30. Now, let's do a quick reminder again. Always you get yourself In a position you do not know what is the sine and cosine of the 90, look at this. Guys, what is the 90 degrees on the unit circle? One zero. This is here. If that's 90, 
the angle is going to be here. We see that the projection on the x-axis is zero, which means that the cosine of 90 is what? Zero. But the sine ash is just along the y-axis, which it means that the sine 90 is one. Then as a result, if I go back to here, I notice that sine of 90 is one and the cosine of 90 is zero, which means that it vanishes this term, zero times cosine, sine 30. Then as a result, you end up as sine 120 equals to the cosine of 30, which is consistent with this identity. The sine of 90 plus 30 goes cosine 30, and that's what we get. What is cosine of 30? You see, always, it's almost 20 years every time I draw that triangle. It's 30, it's the square root of three, it's one into, then cosine of 30 is the opposite, sorry, adjacent, over two, then it becomes this over two. However, we were looking for this value minus sine of 120. We saw sine of 120 becomes the square root of three over two, then minus sine becomes minus the square root of three over two. What we were trying to solve, we were trying to solve this one. Don't forget that we started with that A. What is the expression of sine 40 cosine 160 minus, sorry guys for doing projector. <laughs> Look at this, what was our task? Our initial task was this. We started from this expression. We said that find a value for it. We said that, okay, which reminds us of this identity it becomes sine of minus 120. Then we did all this stuff to get that sine of minus 120 becomes how much? Minus square root of three over two. Then you see that by using some basic laws and rule, rules of trigonometry, we were able to compress this expression into one single number. How beautiful is that, huh? <laughs> the whole expression was crushed into one number. Now, what I told you, at this slide, in order to find sine of 120, there are two methods. One method is there. What is the second method? That's right. That's right, we say that the sine of 120, we can say that 120 is two times, once. Yes. Oh, you mean here? Because it all comes from here. Sine of minus 120 equals minus sine 120. That's right, at the end I added there. That's right, because that's minus one times that expression. Now, before we said that 120 in method one is 30 plus 90, and we just got this expression, the cofunctions identity. Now, I say, Michelle is telling me, 120 can be written as two times 60. If that's the case, let's find this value Instead of 120, I write two times 60. If that's the case, look at this one, guys. Guys, by the way, before I go to the second method, anyone has a question on the first method? Any question on the first method? There's a question about where you drew your unit circle. Oh, which one? Which one, Lauren? Oh, you mean here? Why is it in the first and fourth quadrant? Let me come to see. What, what, oh, I didn't draw it. Oh, what is your question then? Why is it negative 120? Why is it equal to y? Why it is, you mean why this is this? Like when you drew it, isn't that some like 
Oh, it's it's a general one. It's alpha as a general. Like, this law is because if alpha is 260, 30, 40, anything. If that's the case, the symmetry is valued by adding one minus there. If that's minus 20, we get the minus over that. We get minus 20. That was a question? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So now we're going to oh, use the ghost, uh, ghost 160 and the minus ghost 140. Say what? Are we going to use the coaches? Yeah. Oh, you mean here? Yeah. I compare this with this one, the identity. Yeah, yeah, so you're starting that one? That's right. Because I remember this expression reminds me of this one, which I have seen before. But this one, alpha is 40 and beta is 160. Then I say alpha minus beta becomes 40 minus 60, which is minus 120. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Now, Guys, look at the double angle. Please, everyone, quiet. Look at the double angle one. You say that for the double angle, it reminds me of this. We talked about this identity that the sine of two alpha is equals to two sine alpha cosine alpha. It is very important in level five. Last time we had a test. Two weeks ago, in the integration, there was an integration of two sine of sine of uh, cosine to alpha, double angle for cosine, and nobody solved it. And remember, the things that you learn is very important right now because at the calculus level five, you are going to use it. Now, guys, look at this. Whenever then I see that in front of the ratio, I have two. It reminds me of the double angle because the angle, which is six, is double. Then, as a result, Nick, I say that the sine of 120, which is equal to the sine of two times 60, and you see that here we have the two, the double angle, it can be written as what? I use this identity. The double angle identity, which becomes what? Becomes two times sine 60 cosine 60. Now, you see that? Okay, that's quite a relief because here also, you know everything about the 60 angle, Ash. You know that how much is the sine, how much is the cosine? You see that if that's the triangle, which is 30 degrees, which is 60 degrees, we know this length is the square root of three, this one is one, this one is two. Now, we see that now that we have two times, how much is sine 60? 60 is here, opposite, over hypotenuse. However, sine 60 is multiplied to cosine 60. How much is cosine? Adjacent over hypotenuse. Then what do I get? I get two times square root of three over four, which becomes the square root of three over two. How much did we got from the first item? The same thing. Method one took us to the same thing, and method two also took us to the same thing. It was a good practice to practice some of those things that we did last time. Any questions, guys? How much time do we have? Half an hour? Seven. You are kidding. I can't believe this. Oh, I read it wrong. Honestly, how much time? <laughs> I, I'm glad that you are a very honest person. Otherwise, it's only two minutes, and I send you home two minutes.
Three, ten minutes. Three, ten minutes. That's good. Guys, any questions up to this point? No? Now, we have 10 minutes. Let me get something that we can work on this within the time that we have. Okay, now guys, everyone listen to this problem. This is very important. We finish this one, then we go home. Okay, now. Guys, the... no, please, please continue. No, it's fine. I, I finish this very quickly, then we can answer the questions. Now, guys, let's work on this problem. We say that, imagine that the cosine of an angle is three over five, which is quite expected. The cosine is less than one. That's good so far. And we say that the sine of that angle is something negative. Then right now, you should be able to identify the location of the angle. That's right. <laughs> Guys, look at this. Which axis denotes the sine ratio of any arbitrary angle which I have? No, not, not this one. For any arbitrary angle which I have, like this one here. For example, the angle, which is M, O, A. You know that in order to find the sign, you simply from where you are at the point M on the circumference, you make a projections along the Y axis. Anywhere you cross the Y axis, you bring your measurements, you find the measurements, you see that that distance, which is going to be from here, to here, it shows you the sign of the angle, which we call that, for example, as alpha. Then these measurements that you take, you bring your tape and you find the measurements from zero to that point, it is the sign. Now, if the sign is negative, it means that this is located below the X axis. And you see that this happens at quadrant number three and quadrant number four. However, we see that now we have two options. We see that either we are in quadrant three or quadrant four. It's very confusing because we have to be just in one quadrant. The mosquito is, cannot be at the same time at quadrant three and quadrant four. But which one is that? Who says four? Who says three? Who says two? I'm glad no one says quadrant two. Guys, look at that. But look at the sign of the cosine. Cosine is positive. What is the cosine? Is the projections along where? Along the X. This is going to be cosine. Then you see that, guys. If we have the cosine positive, and the sign is negative, they are located at quadrant number four. Now, we ask ourselves, what is the sign of two alpha? First of all, whenever you see sign of two alpha, it reminds you of what? 
That's right. It reminds me of the double angle because I can see too, like the hammer is hitting the alpha. Then what can I say? Then as a result, sine of two alpha becomes two times sine alpha cosine alpha. That's what we have learned last time. That's the double angle formula. And now Nick is telling me, I know the cosine. The cosine is given as three over five in this formula. But how about the sine? Guys, who can help me with this? We have the cosine. We you just want to find the sine of two alpha. We have the cosine. We just want to find sine of two alpha. We know that we are located at the quadrant number four. We know this cosine in this formula is given three over four. I have two, that's right, as a coefficient. But what is the sine alpha? One method, which you are implying the godfather of the trigonometry, and you know what is that? The godfather is this, the Pythagorean theory, which um, the Daniel was saying, and we use the result of Pythagorean theorem, and we come to the godfather equation of the trigonometry, which is one. That's the godfather. And now guys, everyone listen very carefully because now the localizing of the angle at quadrant number four is gonna help us a lot here. Look at this. Then as a result, we say that the cosine of the alpha, no, sorry, sine, because we are looking for the sine of the alpha. We say sine of the alpha, is equal to what? Sine squared is equal, you say one minus cosine squared of the alpha, but you want to sign, you take the square root, but you have to add plus and minus because you know that from the basic algebra that you take the square roots from both sides, you have to add plus and minus. And now look at this. We have sine alpha, equals plus or minus square root of one minus three over five squared plus or minus one minus nine twenty five becomes plus or minus sixteen over twenty five becomes plus and minus four over five a basic algebra which I think now then you see as a result for the sign of the same angle, we got two numbers, plus and minus. Yes, Nick. No, I just, it's a unit circle, which means that the hypotenuse, which is gonna be the radius is always one. Because now we are in the unit circle. And the unit circle R, which is hypotenuse is always one. But we use the godfather. And now guys, this is a very important conclusion. We say that we have sine, a positive and negative number. We said that the sine is going to be negative here. Look at this. We said that the sine of the alpha is negative. Then we say that the only acceptable number is going to be minus four over five. Then as a result, we say that sine two alpha is two times minus four over five for the sine and for the cosine, it is three over five, which becomes minus 24 over 25. This was very important to be able to localize the angle at the quadrant of the unit circle. 
of the quadrant of the unit circle. Because you see that. If you get why it's important, that's the moral of the story. That if you use the godfather and you got the plus and minus number because of this, as you know which quadrant you are, you pick up only one value, either positive or negative. Oh my god, how beautiful is that? Yes. Why do you subtract the 25 by the 9 and where is the one go? Yes. One, because we say that one minus cosine squared alpha. Cosine alpha is 3 over 5. Then becomes one minus 3 over 5 to the bottom. We have one minus 9 over 25. Then mine, one minus 9 over 25 becomes 16 over 25. Because 25 minus 9, which is 16 over 25. Then I take the square root from the numerator denominator. It's four over five. Where did the one go though? One is here. One minus nine over twenty-five, which is becomes sixteen over twenty-five. I subtracted one minus nine. Then why would that be sixteen twenty-five minus nine? Because if you take uh, the common denominator, common is twenty-five, then you have twenty-five minus nine, yeah. which is sixteen. In case if you're still confused, let me explain that to you on the board. Guys, before you leave, sorry, before you leave. Hold on a second, please. 